to uh, go through the process of taking an assembly, uh, starting out kind of with just some pictures, and then turning that assembly, or turning those pictures into a SolidWorks assembly. Uh, Brandon says, voice is super soft. Okay, let's see if, we can, see if we can make that a little bit better, Brandon. I got some gain controls here. See if we can help that out at all. Maybe we'll get a little closer. Try not to overdrive things too much. Let me know if that's any better. Thank you very much for that feedback. And uh, like I said, just keep me... Keep me in the loop here. Looks like I'm still just a smidge low. Let me see if I can do anything with the computer sound settings. Brad says better. Okay, let's keep going. Let's just keep getting better and better. We're gonna always be better. <laughs> let's see here. Let's make sure that we're actually on the correct. Uh, correct. We we loaded a new update here of uh, OBS, so just want to make sure that everything is correct and. This all looks pretty good. All right, guys, let me know um, if that's better, if it still needs to be improved. Brandon, I know you are a professional streamer. Maybe talk into the side more and not in... Oh, talk into the mic more and not into the side of it. Wow, see, these professional streamers know how to uh, give out the, the uh, simultaneous trolling and advice. I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it. All right, cool. I think we're good. Um, let's talk a little bit about this project. Let's get into it. So... The project that we're going to be doing today is the modeling of the red bass guitar, which is behind me over there, red bass guitar. Uh, when we're done modeling that thing, we're going to give it away. So just a little quick background on this thing. Um, I wanted to tell you guys why this bass guitar, why I chose this bass guitar. And so it's actually because of this bass guitar here. Uh, so let me just grab that bass guitar. Take the uh, 3D printed Reaper mask. Set that aside for a second and look at this bad boy here. So this this bass guitar is um, 
It was very inexpensive. Uh, I got this off of Craigslist, and it was in really bad shape uh, when I bought it. But I put some love into it. I, I sank a new pickup into it. I 3D printed some really cool knobbies for it. I 3D printed a thumb rest for it. And uh, this bass just has incredible mojo. Um, there's not a better way to describe it than that. Sometimes you, you get an instrument, and the instrument just has like so much soul built into it. And uh, it's, a, it's a real treasure, and you don't want to mess it up. And so I wanted to create a SolidWorks tutorial on how to model a bass guitar. But I didn't want to mess this beautiful, uh, inexpensive, yet amazing to play bass up. Um, when I say mojo or has soul built into it, what I mean is that anybody that I've ever let play this bass just instantly thinks that they are Les Claypool or Victor Wooten or Jocko. They, uh, they just instantly have chops. As soon as they hold the bass, as soon as they start playing it, just instant chops. So um, it's very special bass. Uh, like I said, I've made some, some mods to it, and we'll talk about those mods as the tutorial goes on. Uh, it is a, a shorter scale bass than a, a normal bass. Uh, so it is a, a slightly smaller instrument than a normal bass, which is you know also kind of interesting, definitely affects how easy it is to play, um, and maybe that's part of the magic as well. So uh, that brings us to the red guy here. Uh, and so what I did was I wanted to create a SolidWorks tutorial. I didn't want to mess up the Magic Mojo base. And so I bought a second base here, um, used, uh, also kind of beat up. These aren't very popular bases. It was a, a rare year. It was a, a rare uh, model that was created. Uh, but it's a pretty cool looking base. Uh, also, same, all the exact same specs as the original. So originally I had that same pickup switch that my finger is directly underneath here. Uh, and so I was able to, uh, you know, get the exact same model. Uh, but this one's more stock. So it, the pickup switch actually works. Mine actually originally was red. Um, you can see some of the, there's like a little, little bit of red there on the corner. You see that? Uh, but the person who I bought it from on Craigslist painted it, uh, which also kind of caught my eye uh, when I saw this thing. So they gave it this really cool paint job, uh, but it was originally that scene uh, kind of red. You can see some of that paint chipping through there. So uh, this thing is, is very cool. Maybe we, can even talk about, maybe we can even talk about how to create a custom appearance and get that uh, same custom appearance in there. But let's go. Let's get into it here. Let's talk a little bit about... Uh, what this process looks like. And we're going to model this thing, ready for this, in SolidWorks 2015, uh, if you can believe it. Uh, I love SolidWorks 2015. You know, all the uh, speed modeling that we've been doing during the tournament, uh, it all led me back to 2015. So what I mean by that is uh, a lot of the models that I was creating were, uh, they just were much more snappy in SolidWorks 2015. Uh, less laggy, less waiting for menus to show up, things like that. So I'm going back retro. Yep, Barry, you got it. We're going retro. We're going back to 2015. But the cool thing about SolidWorks is that all the cool tips and tricks that I'm going to show you in 2015 are perfectly applicable in whatever CAD system you want. Um, I'm also going to, uh, you know, it, it, it allows us to have a little bit more collaboration if there's ever a time to maybe share the models. Uh, it makes it much easier. I don't have to worry about if everybody on the same version or anything because I don't think anybody out there is using an earlier version than 2015 maybe there are people uh, but uh, you know if you're if you're using a later version then you're gonna be perfectly good for opening up these files so the process of you know taking an existing physical model and turning it into a SolidWorks assembly uh, you know it could start in a lot of different ways uh, it's gonna you know more than likely start with some type of measurement taking place uh, measuring your existing models is very common in fact i'm looking around right now to see what i did with my tape measure uh, because i'm going to end up using that just to show you guys the idea of the, the scale length uh, but the scale length on this thing is i believe 32 and a half inches uh, i'll take a look again real quick uh, but uh, i got to um whoops let's get rid of this user all right, yeah, we're gonna get spammed now. That's cool. Uh, so we'll get rid of this user here, and uh, and let's see here. Da, da, da. All right, cool. So um, when it comes to uh, creating a model from 
an existing design, a physical design, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll start out by taking some photos. And I wanted to share with you kind of what the process looks like of, of taking these photos. And so here you can see the, uh, the result of this photo. Uh, so you can see I'm looking down on the top of the bass guitar and I'm gonna end up using this photo to uh, actually drive my design at the top level. And then I'm gonna create what's called a top-down assembly. And so when I create the top-down assembly, uh, I'm gonna be able to I'm going to be, thanks a lot for that, Barry. I just noticed your note there. Uh, I'm going to create a top-down assembly, and I'm going to use that uh, uh, top-down assembly design uh, in collaboration with a single part model. So we're going to have one single part model that's going to drive the entire assembly. And this is utilizing a technique that I call the master model layout sketch approach. Uh, but in order to get to this point, I had to actually take these photos. And so what the process of taking these photos looked like was something like this. So in this photo here, what you can see uh, is that I'm standing on a ladder uh, looking down on the item that I'm trying to get a, a photograph of. And there's a couple of key elements to this photo that I want you to pay attention to. So the first thing that I want you to notice here is that I've got a light pointing down on the, uh, the item. And that way I'm... Maybe not completely eliminating, but I'm certainly reducing the amount of shadows that are going to show up in that photograph when I go to attempt to use that photograph in SolidWorks. Another thing that you'll notice is that I'm standing up on a ladder and looking down on the bass guitar. Now, the reason that I'm doing that is because I'm trying my best to eliminate perspective from affecting the overall layout of this design. So what I mean is when you're, you know, if you if you take a photo of this and your your camera is like right here, directly above the the uh, the item, whatever the item is, doesn't have to be a bass guitar, you're going to end up with a lot of perspective issues. You're going to end up with uh, the items that are closer to the frame being one size, the items that are further away from the frame being a different size. So that's the reason that I'm standing up on this ladder and trying to take the photo from as far away as possible. I mean, really, when I took the actual photo, I was really actually like up here on the ceiling trying to look down to get that photo to further eliminate that idea of perspective. And so we took a photograph of it uh, looking down on it directly from the top and we also then took a photo of it uh, on its side. So we propped it up on its side. I used the uh, Douglas, Douglas Adams Hitchhiker's Guide Complete Edition there because it's nice and thick to help me prop up that uh, horn of the bass guitar. And then I took a photo of it from the side. Now in both of these photos you're also doing your best to take the photo exactly perpendicular to the object. Um, this isn't going to get us perfect, but it's going to give us a great starting point. And you're going to see that as this design goes on, I'm going to be revising this process. Uh, I'm going to be taking more photographs. I'm going to be taking, the, I'm going to be dismantling this entire bass guitar. Uh, that's why I didn't want to mess up the, the good mojo bass. Uh, but um, we're going to put some mojo into this bass as well, don't worry. But we're going to be dismantling this entire bass guitar and uh, putting it back together. And along the way, we're going to take much more precise measurements, much more precise uh, dimensions on this thing, and we're going to refine it. And the cool thing that you're going to see is that when you, when you follow this technique, this master model layout uh, sketch part technique, you have a lot of flexibility to do that. You have a lot of flexibility to revise your design over time, and all those changes just kind of push through, and you don't have to worry about mates not updating or face IDs changing or anything like that because everything is being driven from that master model uh, part sketch. So uh, this is where we start. We start out by trying to get one or several photographs um, another thing that you'll notice in this photograph is that I've got a ruler here. Uh, that's going to be very helpful when I go to drop this into a SolidWorks sketch. I'm going to be able to say, you know, distance from here to here is whatever. In this case, it looks like it's uh, 42 uh, or four, sorry, 48 across that entire uh, stick. So, you know, we can uh, we can use that to help size our, our uh, design, make sure that our photographs are within scale. So there's a, a couple of things that you want to look for when you're when you're setting yourself up for success with these photographs. But the uh, the main things are going to be make sure that you're not running into an issue with perspective. Make sure you're not running into an issue with lighting. Uh, make sure that, you know, ideally you've got some kind of a scale device in the photo that you can use to make sure that your photo comes out to the correct scale when you bring it into SolidWorks. And try to make sure that you're perpendicular to the design. Uh, that's another thing that you can look, and look out for when you are... Um, when you're you're trying to follow along with this process make sure that you're you know perpendicular to the design so in the case of this one what i tried to do was i tried to get a photo where i could pretty much only see one string you know the all the strings are exactly in line together 
Now, in this case, you know, the, the design is so long, uh, has a very long aspect ratio. I wasn't able to get all the strings in line and get uh, the, uh, you know, like the top of the pickup in line and get the uh, uh, tuning pegs in line. Like you can see, ideally, I would only see one tuning peg. The other one here would be, uh, you know, would be off, to, would not be off to the side. But in the case of uh, this this approach, this is fine. This is totally fine. We're just trying to get ourselves close to give ourselves a starting point, and we're going to keep revising, keep revising, keep revising. Let's see here. What's the precision you're aiming for? Great question from the Emerja. So that's a, that's absolutely a wonderful question, and uh, that's uh, something you need to think about. If you're going to use this approach, you know you're not going to be like plus or minus one thou of an inch. Uh, you're going to be your tolerance is going to be a lot higher. Uh, it's going to need to be a lot higher. So it really depends what you're trying to accomplish. Like if your goal is to uh, create some 3D printed parts that you're going to retrofit to this base, well, then using the photograph approach is probably good enough. Um, if your goal is to, you know, I mean, if your goal is to manufacture an instrument, there's going to be better ways to learn how to do it correctly. There's a lot going on within uh, this instrument, and there's a lot of uh, subtle curvature that's going to be very difficult to capture when you're just taking photographs. If your goal is to create a nice assembly that you can use for tips and tricks videos and that you can use to help uh, teach people how to use this technique, then, you know, you're in the right spot. This is good to go for you. So it really just depends on, uh, you know, what tolerance you're, you're shooting for. You know, that being said, I have absolutely used this approach for, for relatively precise applications. Um, this is a, uh, this here is a webcam cover that I designed using this approach. So took a photograph of the, um, of the uh, webcam so that I could get all the dimensions. And this thing fits on super snug, you know, so... There, there certainly are a lot of applications that you can use, and you can still get close enough, uh, you know, within maybe a millimeter or two, uh, certainly if you're doing a lot of 3D printing. What's up, Anti-Venom? How you doing? And John uh, McClary here says, I use the photo as a shape reference, then use actual measurements with calipers and tape measures. That's exactly what I'm going to be doing as well, John. Uh, you're spot on. That's exactly what I'm going to be doing as well. It's a great comment uh, and definitely something I want to make sure everybody sees here that we're going to start out by getting the basic shape into SolidWorks. We're going to use that to drive our assembly, but we're going to be continuing to go back uh, in, in future live streams and revising this geometry, especially once we take this thing apart and we can really get in there with a caliper and really clearly measure the locations of things, uh, this is going to get much more refined. And so I hope that's what you take away from uh, this part of the presentation. All right, cool. So let's get into it here. Um, let's get into some live modeling in SolidWorks and take a look at what this uh, entire technique would look like here. Uh, so let's see what we got here. What happened? I bumped my bumped my keyboard cam a little bit over. Where's my keyboard? There it is. There she is. All right. Cool. Don't forget, if you guys want some shirts, I got the Two Tall Toby shirt on today. I always try to remember to let, let people know that the shirts are available. We got the merch store up and running properly. And let me add in the chat here as well, uh, just so that if anybody's saying anything, we get it captured in the live stream uh, so that we can so we can have it for the record. It's going to be a little small. I apologize for that. All right, here we go. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Everything's looking good. I think we're good to go here. Hopefully the audio is good. Hopefully the music is good. Hopefully you guys are feeling good. Uh, let's see here. The guitar, the guitar nerd in me is stoked for this. All right. Awesome, Brad. Glad to hear it. So here we go. We're going to go uh, new and we're going to create a new part. So I'm going to create a new part here in using the inches template uh, since our scale is in inches. And uh, then we are going to maybe uh, create a new template. This is something that a lot of people ask me about. Hey, how do you create a new template? So if your goal is to create a new template, what you'll typically do is start with a new part. And then there's four areas that I always look at when I'm creating a new template. Uh, the first area and definitely the most important one is the document properties. So every when you go into a new part and you go to this section here that says document properties, everything in doc props is saved in the template. 
So that's what you want to remember. Everything that's on this tab here is saved into your template. And the most important thing here is units. So when you're trying to create a new document template, you want to make sure that you go to units. If you want to be working in inches, you know, set it to IPS. If you want to, you know, use street place decimal, that's fine. Set that as well. Um, there's some other options that you can adjust here for your units, but that's the most important thing. But you just want to remember that everything through here, if you, you know, if you say to yourself, hey, every time I start a new part, I have to go in and change the size of my arrows. Well, that's part of your document properties. Every time I start a new part, I have to go in and uh, change the image quality. Well, that's part of your document properties. When it comes to image quality, generally speaking, you want to be in about this range here. Uh, you don't want to go too high. Your files will actually grow in file size and they will also become very cumbersome. And you don't want to go too low because then your circles will turn into hexagons. So, you know, you want your, your this range here, this kind of like middle uh, half to, uh, to two thirds. That's a good range for your image quality to be in in your template. And um, units, dimensions, I mean, everything that's in here. Everything that's in here is going to be saved in your template. I'm not going to go through and, and spend time talking about every single option, but everything that's in here, that's the, the first thing that's saved into your templates. The next thing that's saved into your templates is your document properties. So if you uh, wanted to set up your, your files so that every time you're, you know, you're working with consistent document properties, you might do something here like uh, drawn by and then put the, uh, you know, the person's name. In my case, it's going to be too tall Toby. And then you might do something like um, draw on date. That's probably a good one. Maybe you can have that show up on your uh, on your uh, template. So this would be um, month, day, year. And uh, maybe there's some other properties you want to include in here, like um, a YouTube project, something like that. And this will be red bass guitar giveaway. I can never remember if giveaway is one word or two. So I've been like <laughs> intermixing that. First thing that's stored in your template is your document properties. Second thing that's stored in your template is your uh, is your uh, proper file property information. Uh, next is any information that you put over here in the tree. So if we were to rename this, instead of this being front plane, if we called it uh, XY plane, something like that, uh, that would be stored in the document template. If we were to add any additional geometry, like if I wanted to uh, create an axis here between these two planes and I wanted to include that in my document template, well, that's how you could do it. You could create it and then save your template. So any additional geometry that you create here is saved in your template. So that's the third thing. Okay, so the first thing is your uh, options document properties. The second thing is your uh, file properties, and I usually go to custom to set those up. The third thing is anything that you do over here to manipulate the tree, that will be stored in your document template. And then the last thing is this view pull down menu here, view, if you do view um, origins, like if I wanted to have origins always hidden or origins always shown, axes, temporary axes, all this stuff that you do here is also going to be stored in your template. I guess you could also say that like part color changes are stored in your template, but for me, those are usually derived from my materials. So I'm not going to worry too much about that. And once you get those four things set up, you're going to do file, save as, and then you're going to take this and you're going to put it into a save as type. So you want to make sure you remember to change this first, your save as type, change that to a save as type. And we're going to save this as a part template. Now, for me, what I do personally is I create a directory in my C drive called Toby SolidWorks Library. And then in this Toby SolidWorks Library, I have a different folder for each year of SolidWorks. Uh, so I've been using SolidWorks for a long time. So I have all these old libraries and, and basically each year I audit my template folder and I update it. The real takeaway here is just make sure that you have a folder you can get to easily so that you can, uh, um, you know, back it up. Uh, so that you can browse to it easily. Like everything that's in my SolidWorks library is in that folder. So if I ever need to go to a new computer, I just copy this whole folder, drop it in the C drive on my new computer, and then I can start pointing my libraries to this folder. Templates, weld mint cutlass, sheet metal gauge tables, you know, everything, uh, everything is just going to land in that folder. Chat is blurry, John. I apologize for that. I'll, uh, I'll see if I can... I'll see if I can do anything about it. I actually don't. I don't think I'm able to do anything about it. <laughs> I'll do. I'll fix it for the next stream. Uh, but it's good to know. I appreciate the feedback. So then I'll call this uh, templates. So this is just my red bass guitar giveaway templates, and this is going to be called part dash inch, 
There we go. And we're going to do the same thing with our assembly. So we go here to assembly inch. We go to our document properties. We go document properties units. Make sure that we're set to inches. Make sure that we're set to the uh, desired decimal places. Go to our image quality. Make sure our image quality is in the right spot. Go to anything else that we want to change here. That's item number one. Item number two is we go to our file properties and we can uh, you know, set up our file properties. I'm just gonna call this one uh, YouTube project. Just something that I can search and I'll call this uh, red bass guitar giveaway. One word this time, let's mix it up. Let's really mess with the search engine. Uh, anything that we wanna change in the tree, which I usually don't. Anything we wanna change in the view pull down menu for assemblies, I like to see my origins. So I'm gonna say view origin to make sure that that's shown. File, save as, and we're going to call this an assembly template. And we're going to go to our uh, that same directory, our C drive. We're going to go to our SolidWorks library, red bass guitar giveaway. And we'll call this one assembly or assem dash inch. So you can do the same thing with millimeters if you if you wanted to, uh, but that is how you go about creating your templates in SolidWorks. A lot of people ask about that in the comments, so I figured I'd just spend 10 minutes and go through it real quick. The uh, other thing that I want you to know is that once you're done doing that, you have to remember to go to your options and point to that template. Otherwise, when you click new, you're not gonna see those templates. I don't see that 2022 bass guitar giveaway template tab. So I'm gonna go options, file locations, and then I'm gonna say document templates. I wanna add the new location that I that I just was uh, pointing to. SolidWorks remembers where we just were, which is, which is pretty nice. So I'm gonna add that location. And whenever you get this dialog box, would you like to make the following changes to your search paths? You just say no. Um, we don't really have to go into too much detail as to why, but uh, this is something that a lot of people say yes to. And what you're doing essentially is you're adding indexing locations to your search, uh, Windows search functionality and Windows indexing. And uh, you really don't need to be doing that. So um, unless you are going to be maybe searching for this template name, the, the answer is no. Generally speaking, the answer is no here. Um, most of the time, it's a marginal decision, but occasionally, if you inadvertently add a bunch of search index locations to your network drive or from your network drive, uh, it can cause some degradation in speed. So, no. And now we go new, and now we see we've got this new tab here to create a new part in inches. Cool. So, uh, Tambora Station in the chat, what's up, what's up, what's up? I hope you're enjoying your shirt. I hope it is super soft. My shirt is very, very soft. I wear it every day, all day, every day. I've been wearing this one since the tournament, and I haven't showered. So uh, nobody hangs out with me anymore. But, you know, I got you guys to hang out with. Uh, the uh, new part that we created, the new, the new document we created is a part file because we're going to be working from the top down using a single part file to drive the geometry of all of our other components. So with that being said, let's get in here. Let's create a, a, a layout here for our entire assembly using this one single part file. And we're going to do that by starting a new sketch on the top plane. Actually, you know what we're going to do first? We're going to go to this image that we created and we're gonna open up this image in a uh, photo editor. So I'm gonna open this in a free photo editor that I use a lot called paint.net. It's totally free, um, not as good as a, uh, you know, a paid uh, photo editor, but uh, definitely works for a lot of the stuff that I need to do to get my photos ready for SolidWorks. And in this case, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, whoops, I'm gonna take my selection tool and I'm gonna window uh, just the bass guitar here and I'm gonna do an image crop to selection. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate the image. So I'm gonna say image uh, rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise so that it's vertical. And then I'm gonna finish up by adding a layer. So this is a lot like uh, what you might do in a traditional, like a 2D CAD program where you've got the ability to work with layers. So I'm gonna add a new layer here and then I'm gonna create a vertical line. So in this case, I just hold shift and that lets me create a vertical line. And I'm gonna use that vertical line in that second layer to adjust the orientation of the first layer. So I made this black vertical line here. Um, now I'm going to do a uh, select all and a move. And then I'm gonna rotate and move this entire thing into place here where that vertical line is going right up the dots on the fretboard. So this is just, you know, you can adjust the image in SolidWorks, but I think it's a lot easier to do it in a photo editor. You can make those kind of subtle adjustments and get it, you know, just right. And what I'm trying to do here is all these dots that are on the fretboard, I want that line to be going as close as I can right through the middle of all those dots. 
It's pretty close. Maybe just adjust it a smidge more. It's one of those things where after you adjust it a smidge more, you're like, oh no, I went too far. That's pretty good. So it's also going through this screw here. That's, that's you know, pretty darn close as far as uh, what we're trying to accomplish with this thing. So that's going to give me uh, my, my uh, layout image that I'm going to end up using in SolidWorks. I'm going to get rid of that extra layer. I might do one final crop here. Ah, the, no, I can't do it. It's not going to work. So that's okay. I'm going to just leave it as is. I'm going to say file, save as, and in that same directory, I'll call this uh, bass guitar assembly photo top. And then we're going to rinse and repeat with that side view. So we'll take the side view here. Uh, we're going to image, rotate 90 degrees clockwise. We're going to add a layer. We're going to take a vertical line here. It's a little subjective what should be considered, you know, vertical in this case. Uh, should it be the strings? I mean, should it be the, the neck, right? Uh, I'll probably just do this to the strings. I think that'll get me close enough. It's what I'm, it's what I'm going to be playing. You know, your design might have different problems. Like, maybe it actually makes more sense to do this to the body, the top of the body. You know, you could go either way. I'm just going to do this to the strings. So then we're going to do a selection here, uh, another one of these crop to selection, image crop to selection. And let's see here. Strings are, John says strings are angled, should be to the body. All right. I was thinking that too. Okay. I agree. John, you and I are, are exactly in sync today. So uh, I like it. I appreciate the sanity check. <laughs> So, okay, yeah, so we'll adjust this a little bit. Again, you have to kind of account for perspective, but that looks pretty good. I think I'm happy with that. So we'll adjust that to the uh, body. You can kind of see the neck. The, the, what, what happens with a bass guitar with any guitar is that it's kind of like a bow and arrow. Um, the, the neck is intended to bend, and there's actually a, a rod that runs through the middle of the neck that you can tighten and loosen. It's called truss rod. And uh, if your base is not set up correctly, if it's too straight, you can loosen that and it'll become a little bit more bowed. And if it's too loose, if, if your action's too high down here, you can tighten that. Uh, and there's, you know, there's a whole process that goes into setting that up. Uh, but it is, you know, it, it is meant to be curved and we're kind of seeing that curvature here from this view. So that's good. Everything looks good here. Get rid of that extra layer. Uh, maybe crop this in just a little bit tighter. This is a 3D printed amp that I created that's battery powered. It's kind of fun. Maybe we'll talk about that someday too. And file, save as, and we're going to call this the same name as the top one, but we'll just call this one side. Okay. We're doing good here. So now we go back into SolidWorks. Now, at this point, um, I apologize. Uh, you just guys just got to excuse me just for one moment. I'm going to just go grab my tape measure. I left it over on the other side of the room. So just give me one sec. And this will give us a, a little bit of a sanity check here. So we're going to measure from... So from the bottom of the bridge to the top of the nut, it's uh, 33 and 3 eighths. Uh, so that's just going to give us a little bit of a sanity check as we are uh, creating this image. Uh, one thing that we could do is we could go front plane, uh, begin a sketch. Oh, sorry, top plane. We're gonna do this on that. What should we do? Should we do it upright like it's on the stand? I think I'd, I don't know. I don't know which one would look better. I think it might look laying down on his back. Such, so many important decisions, right? As we're creating this thing. Let's lay it down on the, like it's laying down on the ground here. So what we could do, um, and I've certainly done this before, is we could just take a caliper measure of the nut. Uh, it's probably around two inches. And then we that's at the top of the nut. Um, we could even just like model that nut uh, which I'll grab the dimensions on that in a second. And then we could take our 33 and 3 eighths down to the bridge, the bottom of the bridge. And then we could also uh, create a measurement at the bottom of the bridge. And so this is something that, that uh, I do a lot as well, just as a, a sanity check slash layout for the design. Um, so I'll, I'll show you what I mean here in just a sec. So. 
So I'm gonna just take another couple of quick measurements. So 1.62, 1.63. point two so we could do something like this two one point sixty five oops one point sixty five and then this is let's measured at zero point two and so what this does for us is it sets us up so that um, we've got a nice reference when we go to create our um, we go to when we go to drop in our layout sketch see when you drop in the layout sketch one of the big challenges is figuring out what the correct size is and I know that SolidWorks offers that scale tool but that scale tool isn't in my experience isn't quite as accurate as something like this so this might be um, layout and I would just call this one nut to bridge and then what I, a lot of times I'll do is I'll right mouse button and I'll say sketch color and I'll change that to something that really pops uh, like a magenta when I bring in that image. So now once again, I'm going to go, this is a new sketch. I'm going to go top plane, begin a sketch, orient my view. I'm going to go tools, sketch tools, sketch picture. That's uh, down at the bottom here. I know it's off the screen. Tools, sketch tools, sketch picture. And we're going to go to this red base giveaway and grab that photo of the base from the top. Now, the good news here is that it should be pretty much uh, as vertical as we want it. You know, we shouldn't have to do too much as far as the uh, as far as the uh, rotation of this this image. And then what we can do is we can we can uncheck this option here, this enable sketch tool, because when that is enabled, you can't grab the corner of the image and start dragging it. So you have to remember to uncheck that option, enable sketch tool. And then we can take this image here and we can just grab the corner of the image and start resizing it. And what's nice here is that because of our sanity check, uh, we can we can see here, you know, whether or not this, you know, in this case, we measured the bridge. We measured the bridge at three point three point two. Uh, whatever we measured it at and we can just l keep resizing this until it's you know until it's aligned with that till we get that to that 3.2 i know that the again i know we, we've talked about this already the uh because of perspective this thing might look a little bit off as far as uh it being horizontally aligned but all this stuff will start coming together as we continue with this design so i mean look at that wow it's like perfect i mean you know, maybe not exactly perfect, but it's pretty darn close to perfect there. Just from doing that kind of loose uh, layout there, you can see that that nut, uh, the nut is, uh, sorry, if, if you don't know, this is this is the nut here. It's a it's typically a plastic piece that has grooves in it that the strings fit through at the very top of the neck. That's called the nut. Nut. So, um, you know, I took measurements of the nut, physical measurements, and then I took measurements of the bridge and the string, the, the length from one to the other. And uh, man, we are like almost exactly in line with that image. So that's good. That means that when I took the picture, I didn't experience a lot of perspective in that picture. Uh, that's very, you know, it's, it's helpful. It's useful to know that information. And um, we might take some other dimensions on the neck. You know, we might we might consider taking like a dimension of the neck at the top and a dimension of the neck at the bottom uh, to, to really get this thing, you know, perfectly aligned. Uh, the more you do in this first step, the better. You know, the, the more measurements you take, the more laying out of this thing that you do, the better. Uh, but in this case, I think we're, we're close enough. We're going to let this go. And um, at this point, you know, we have to decide if we're going to actually use this geometry as part of our layout. And I mean, I think we should, you know, I think that that, that nut, you know, it, it measured in there pretty well. I think we're pretty much good there for that. So we're going to continue to use that. We're going to continue to use that bridge as well. And uh, as we go through the rest of the design, we'll see kind of what the implications of that are. So now this is going to be renamed to um, uh, lay uh, this this will be called image or picture. A lot of times I call these things different things. This will be called picture base from top. 
Uh, another thing that you can do when you get in, you edit that sketch and you double click on that image. Another thing that you can do is you can uh, change the transparency here. So I could say I want to use a transparency on the full image. That's very useful when you've got parts that are behind that image. So um, just something to keep in mind is that you've got the option to change the transparency so that you can actually see through it. I typically set this to, you know, something uh, a little bit in the range of like 20%, 20, 30%. Um, we'll do that in a little bit. I want this to be pretty solid for now so that I can see this as I'm laying out my design. And then finally, again, just as a sanity check, if you wanted to, you could go to the uh, top plane here and you could create a sketch of a line that is the same length as this ruler. I think it's 48. Um, and we could see how close we are to the length of that ruler. Was it 48? Wow. That's interesting. That's like way off. Huh. All right. Well, that's going to have to be uh, a little bit of food for thought. I'm not sure why that would be. That's like That seems like it's ridiculously off uh, compared to the measurements that we took here. I mean, it's good. It's good to do these sanity checks. Uh, you, can, you can try to figure out if you messed anything up. So 33.375. You know, 0 0.2, 1.63, 3 3.2. Let me just take a quick sanity check. I don't know, maybe just because it was slightly elevated, maybe because the the base was slightly elevated. I can't imagine that it would account for that much deviation. So uh, for now, I'm going to I'm gonna just remember uh, that that was off um, and just kind of keep an eye on it. But I'm pretty confident with the results that I got from those dimensions and that, that uh, proportions are all correct. So I'm going to keep moving forward with the project. So we're going to save this, uh, control S for save. We're going to put this into our uh, 2020, uh, 2022, 1212 red base giveaway project folder. And we're going to call this one. Now, at this point, a lot of times it's good to come up with some uh, type of a naming scheme. Uh, so for me, this is going to be RBG for red base giveaway. And then it's going to be dash. And then this is going to be 000 dash. And then it's going to be uh, master layout part you know so this will be like uh red base red base master layout part and i'm going to say save so you notice this naming scheme is i assign a code name to the project the code name is R rbg and then i assign a part number part numbering scheme starts at zero 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 because this isn't really a part it's not a manufactured part and uh and then this is going to be red base master layout part so that's going to be saved uh, maybe at this point we would also put it into data management so we could go into our data management system here um, and we could maybe consider putting that into the data management system we do have a project set up for this thing so we could do check in active document and we're going to check this thing in at revision 0.1 this way we've got a snapshot of this thing in time and this is an older data management system but the main point here is that i'm taking the current version of this part and saving it and then moving on to the next version so that if any at any point in the future if i want i can go back to that current part. So we'll check this into the red base giveaway project and there we go. All right, so now let's start designing the geometry for the body. So we're gonna go top plane, begin a sketch, orient the view, and we're gonna create the geometry for this body. You can see that the body uh, is essentially one piece of wood. Originally, it was probably, they're usually three pieces of wood that are that are glued together at the center. So um, if we were to scrape the paint off this thing, we'd probably see like a, a seam here and a seam here. Uh, that's pretty common in guitar work, but we're just gonna say it's one big piece of wood. And we now are challenged to trace this piece of wood. Now, again, this design is going to get revised as we start taking the base apart because we're going to start seeing uh, different pockets and things that are inside of the base. You know, like, for example, behind where the neck sits here, this is actually a pocket that's cut into the body. So we're going to try to capture that information down the road. And where this thing scoops up in the back, you know, it kind of comes up and over and then comes back down here. So we're going to have to account for that somehow as well. And right now we're just going to kind of guesstimate where that goes and once we start taking this thing apart we'll revise this master layout sketch so let's start there let's just start with that um, there's a there's a plate that goes on the back of the bass guitar so i'm just going to create a line that goes across here like so and that's going to be the uh kind of back section of this thing 
and then uh, this is going to be coming down at an angle, and that angle is going to really be uh, defined by the... Um, actually, that line shouldn't be up that high. It's probably more like down here. So um, let's now start creating the geometry for the base itself. And here what we're going to do is we're going to learn a little bit about splines. And the most important thing that we can learn about splines is that less points is better you don't need to go around this thing and be like click 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 we're going to trace around this thing look at all these points that we've got this thing looks great right yeah it's, it's so easy uh the problem with a, G a design like this is that when you go to make adjustments everything ends up wrinkling and you really don't want that it's it's it becomes a real nightmare to work with when you have all these different points here so instead what we do is when we're working with splines uh, what we do is we just try to uh, work in peaks and valleys so whenever you're working with a spline whether you're trying to trace an image or whether you're trying to just work with splines in general you want to just work with peaks and valleys what's up Parge how you doing Parge enter W great to see you in here it says style spline for the win. Yes, yeah, style spline is definitely an option. Um, you can definitely work with that as well. Uh, but uh, I like I like regular splines, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with that for now. Uh, but style splines are definitely legit. So here, what I mean is uh, when we come when we're working with peaks and valleys, it means like this is a valley right here, it's the very bottom of this arc. So I'm gonna click a point there. This is a peak here of the horn. So I'm gonna click a point there. Uh, this maybe is a peak out here of this uh, of the horn over on this side. I'll probably need one there. I'll take a point down here. I'll come out here to this location. I'll come down here to the bottom. And a lot of times when I'm doing this kind of uh, design work for guitars, I will do it in two halves uh, just because it kind of gives me a, uh, a nice reference point. So I might create you know a point here that goes uh, all the way up to the origin. I might even just drop in a dimension on that point just to kind of lock it in place. So whatever that happened to be, thirty little just just over thirty five, you know, I might just drop in a point there and leave it as so, and that way I can work on one half of this, and then I can work on the other half. So when it comes to working on this one half here, now we need to kind of refine these points. Well, because they're all just single points, this is a pretty easy process. You just click on the spline point, and then you grab this little handle here, and you start gently dragging this handle, and that's it. It's like magic. You don't have to do it on all of them. Some of them you can just let kind of work themselves out. Uh, they will essentially be driven by the geometry of the other points. But, uh, you know, if you do need to make those kinds of subtle adjustments, the option is there. And so what we're looking at here on the spline handle is we're looking at what's called uh, an adjustment for the degree of tangency and an adjustment for the magnitude of tangency. So let's say, for example, we click on this arrow here. What we've got is we've got this... Uh, this diamond shape, which is the degree of tangency. Okay, the degree of tangency or degree of tangency influence. And so what that means is if you just grab that little diamond shape and you start moving it, you can see you're able to adjust what the angle of the spline is coming off of that handle, just the angle. Now, the other uh, little uh, arrow here, this is like uh, kind of like a triangle, that's what's called the uh, tangency influence. Wait, what is it? Oh, magnitude. Magnitude of tangency influence. And so, with that little diamond, that little uh, uh, triangle shape, what happens is if you grab that and you move it up or down, you're assigning. It's like you're you're weighing that tangency constraint more heavily at that location. In other words, you're making the curvature uh, go straight for longer and then gradually taper off into the next point. So you've got your magnitude of tangency influence, your angle of tangency influence. And these can be defined, they can be dimensioned. Um, let's say for example, I have a horizontal line here and this end point here is fixed. So now that end point is locked in space. Well, I can take an angle dimension and click on this little diamond and then click on this horizontal line and I can create an angle dimension, say I make it 120, you know, or if I make it 90, then it's going vertical, or if I make it uh, 75, then you can see it's kicking off the other way. So you can assign an angle dimension and you can also assign a magnitude dimension here. So you click on the little triangle and then you can see that you can uh, assign a magnitude of dimension. So if I make that 10, I don't know, I don't really understand what that means. It says 10 inches, but I don't really understand what it means. I just know that as you increase that number incrementally, uh, that tangency influence is gonna be stronger. It's like you're taking that handle and dragging it out. So that's great to know for little subtle adjustments. Um, and then the final thing I'll just say is if you grab the dot, you can do both. So if you grab this little dot at the end here, that lets you do both the angle 
and the magnitude all in one step. So that's a little uh, uh, overview of how spline works, uh, splines work. And so in this case, you can see that we can use that knowledge to uh, grab our peaks and valleys here and continue to adjust. So this one, I would adjust the angle as well as the magnitude in order to uh, try to get that curve to match. This one here, I might uh, do the same thing. Maybe just adjust the angle a smidge so it's a little more vertical. And we'll make this, we'll do the same with this one. And then finally, we'll finish off with this one. Now this one here, what I might do, uh, because it's exactly at this point, and this point is at the very bottom of the base, I might take this, this arrow here, click on it, and then come over to the left here and say that I want that to be horizontal. So you can also assign sketch relationships to your splines, uh, to the uh, influence handles. So like I can say I want that to be horizontal, and that way uh, when this spline you know, comes to this point here, which is the midpoint of the design, it just comes in nice and smooth. And then I'll do the same thing with the spline going in the other direction. So we'll do a spline here. We'll click uh, peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, right? So we'll click the peak over here. We'll come into the valley down here. Peaks and valleys is a big takeaway. If you don't take anything else away from today's live stream, uh, I hope that this lesson on peaks and valleys will bring you some value at some point. Okay, and now we are able to, uh, once again, start making some adjustments here to our peaks and valleys. Horizontal curvature continuous or horizontal to a construction line. Yep, there's, there's a, you're gonna get into the weeds a little bit here when you start working with splines and curvature and, and start to understand curvature. And it depends on who your customer is too. Um, like uh, if you do, if you work with thermoforming people uh, that are in like cosmetics industry, they are uh, meticulous about you know, not having any visible edges or seams or wrinkles or anything. And something that doesn't even look like a wrinkle to you because it's it's tangent, you know, you, you see it and you're like, what's the problem? It's tangent, we're good here, uh, might look unacceptable to them. So it really depends on your customer. In this case, I think I need one more. Uh, I skipped the, the, the peak here. So I'll do a right mouse button on the spline and then I'll do insert spline point. That's a right mouse button command, insert spline point. And then I can click on this spline here and return to the select function and give myself that spline point there. There we go. And uh, let's see here, we're gonna take this guy and do the same thing that we did on the other side. So uh, increase the, the influence of tangency, decrease the influence of tangency, increase the influence of tangency, maybe adjust the angle of tangency until we get this thing to more or less line up there. So less points is better in the in the case of splines. You want the splines to be smooth. Uh, you do have the ability. If if I was, you know, if I was designing this guitar for someone or for myself, uh, I might want to do a, a right mouse button on the spline and say show curvature combs, and then increase the density of those curvature combs. Maybe increase the scale as well. And then this shows you how smooth your whoops. Maybe I went a little too far with that scale. This shows you how smooth your transitions are. So it's like the curvature here is uh, it's running smooth and then it gets a little bit like it's kind of like an abrupt shift there and then smooth. Then there's a in inflection point here where it flips over from positive to negative. Same thing on this side. This for the most part looks pretty smooth. A couple of little spots where it just abruptly changes. But for the most part, I think this looks pretty smooth. And so then we could do a right mouse button again and we could say, don't show me the curvature combs. And then finally on this guy here, we could say that we want that to go horizontal. And that's pretty good. That's pretty much, uh, whoops, looks like there's one area here that's maybe just needs a little bit of love. Let's see. There we go. That's pretty good. I'm happy with that. That, that definitely would uh, pass as far as a uh, you know a quick quick rendering quick overview of this thing so now what are we gonna do with this uh, design how does this actually work as far as an assembly goes and we can start the assembly right now we don't have to wait um, a lot of times we get anxious we get excited we want to start seeing what our parts look like in assembly mode so this is what the assembly might look like I might uh, finish that sketch and I might call this one uh, layout master um, this would be called. I can just call it, yeah, master base body. Okay, so that's the layout master for the base body. That means that anything that I do with the body uh, part file really needs to be derived from this sketch. So let's right mouse button on the sketch. Let's go to sketch color. Let's make that something that really pops, like this nice cyan color here really pops out. Okay, that looks pretty good. And so now I'm going to save that part file and I'm going to go file 
make assembly from part. Now, this is you know where we get into this idea of taking a single part file and using it to drive every single part in the assembly. So I'm gonna go here to file, make assembly from part. And I'm gonna pick from my bass guitar giveaway template, I'm gonna pick this assembly inch and I'm gonna add that part to the assembly. And you'll notice that I added it directly on the origin. The origin of the assembly and the origin of this master model part are both right here. Very important, very important that the origin on all of your parts that are um, driven by the layout, which in this case, all the parts that are driven by the layout are probably gonna be, I mean, really, it's probably just gonna be the body and the neck. I don't know if there's really any need to have any of the other parts. Those are the only two parts that are really significantly interfacing with one another. You might make the argument that the tuners could be part of that that design or even the nut. Uh, but, you know, th those are all pretty much like off-the-shelf parts. They're not like, uh, it's not important that they fit together uh, the way it's important that the neck and the body fit together because there's actually an interlock between the two. You know, we'll see how it goes. I'll, I'll, I'm going to sleep on that one. I'm going to think about how much I really want to include in the master model. Maybe the pickup will be part of the master model. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But definitely the body and definitely the neck are going to be part of this master model layout assembly. So let's save the assembly. And uh, once again, I'm going to use my code here, uh, RBG dash. And in this case, I'm going to use the number 1001. So whenever I uh, uh, go from working with single parts to working with assemblies, I go from working with three digit numbers to working with four digit numbers. This is just my personal uh, serialization code. I don't care what you use as long as you're using something, as long as your company is using something. You need to have some kind of a, a, a system in place in order to keep your parts and your assemblies organized. And my system is my parts start at 001. Usually if I go from one sub assembly to another, the part file would go, you know, 101, 201, 202, 203, 204, like different sub assemblies would start with a different number. And then similar, similarly, the assemblies would do the same thing. So I'd have 1001 for the top level master assembly, and then 2001 would be the first sub assembly. Uh, 3001 would be the next sub assembly. And if there's a sub assembly underneath that, that might be like 3301, something like that. So, you know, you'll have to decide what uh, is appropriate for your your type of work, but this is how I organize my uh, serialization of my file names. And then this will be called master, actually I'll just call this uh, top level red bass guitar giveaway assembly. Top level. Once again, we could uh, check that into our PDM system. So I can go check an active document. Now you'll notice here something that's kind of cool is SolidWorks sees that the master part has changed so it's gonna automatically bump that to a new revision. So now I'll have version one and version two, and at any time I could go back to version one. That's really helpful if you uh, have like a branch, if you wanna branch your design a little bit. Uh, so we'll go check in, check in both of these files, the assembly and that master model part file. And now we are ready to create the body for this bass guitar. And so to create the body for this bass guitar, we're going to go to the command insert component new part. Now. At this point, uh, we should just talk briefly about a couple of options that you want to have turned on if you're if you're following along with. Um, if you're just watching, it's, it's fine. You don't have to worry about this. But if you're actually clicking along with, you're going to want to go into your system options and go into external references. And you're going to want to say, um, oh, wait, I'm sorry. I said this wrong. System options and go into assemblies. And you're going to want to say, save co new components to external files and this is just an option that i like to use uh, where whenever i click save i get a brand new file i don't i'm not making a virtual part i'm not i'm not creating a part that exists in the context of the assembly i'm making a new part file so uh you know system options assemblies save new components to external files uh, that's one of the options that i adjust when i'm using this master model uh, technique so insert component, new part. And now immediately SolidWorks is gonna say, what do you wanna call this thing? I'm gonna call this thing RBG-001 uh, red base body, red base body. So we'll go save. And now we get this indicator uh, that SolidWorks is looking for the starting plane for this new part. It's like a arrow with a little green check mark on it. And you will, if you're following this technique that I'm teaching you, you will always select 
the front plane of the assembly. Uh, this will essentially align the origin of your new part with the origin of the assembly, uh, but more importantly, it just keeps everything nice and tidy and makes it very easy to follow this approach. So you always pick front plane. When you go insert component new part, you always pick front plane. And now the front top and right plane of my new part are aligned with the front top and right plane of my assembly and the front top and right plane of my master model. Uh, that's what we want. We want everything to all be aligned. We don't want origins to be all over the place when we're using this technique. The downside is that you do get placed into sketch mode. So I can tell I'm in sketch mode because I've got this indicator up in the corner as well as the red sketch origin here. You only ever see that red sketch origin when you're in a sketch. So I don't want to be sketching on the front plane of, uh, you know, of the assembly or of this new part. So I'm just going to exit that sketch. And then I'm going to go to the top plane of my new part. So I'm, I'm going here to the top plane of my new part. And when I go to the top plane of my new part, I'm going to begin a new sketch. So select a plane, begin a sketch, orient the view, top plane of my new part. And then I'm going to right mouse button on this uh, cyan colored sketch, and I'm going to choose select chain. That selects all the entities that are part of that sketch. I'm going to say convert entities. And now I'm ready to take the body of that bass guitar and do a boss extrusion. And so this boss extrusion is going to go down and this new part is in millimeters. It's supposed to be in inches, but that's okay. And I'm going to quick take a measurement. So it looks like about uh, 1.779. Now, some instruments are cur they have a lot of curvature in the body. This one's pretty flat, uh, generally speaking, but that's something else that you'd want to be aware of if the instrument has curvature on the back or especially curvature on the top. A lot of times we see instruments with curvature on the top, uh, but this one is pretty flat, so I'm going to say 1.779 inches and hit the green check mark. And now we have created our first component in the, uh, in the assembly. What's up, T-R-E-K-T, -E Tract? So that's our first component in the assembly, and the significance of uh, this, you know, kind of the overall technique that we're talking about today and the significance of that component in particular are that if we return to our master model uh, layout part and we look at this thing, you know, from the top view and we say that we want to edit that sketch of the base body and, you know, let's say maybe we're making a new permutation or we want to put our own spin on this uh, base guitar. Well, we're going to change that master model layout sketch like so, and then we're going to return to the assembly and we're going to see that the assembly is going to update. And so whatever changes we make in that master model technique are going to uh, automatically propagate into all of the parts that are derived from that master model. Now, the significance of this or the, the importance of this it comes into play when you've got parts that are interlocking with one another. So in the case of this base, You can see here, let me flip over to my, uh, to my webcam screen. So you can see here uh, the way that the neck, it, it sits into the body. So there's a pocket in the body, in the front here. This is kind of what I was talking about before. There's a pocket here that the neck sits down into. And those two parts need to be designed, you know, in relation to one another. Because if, if uh, you know, if the neck changes, if we decide to use a different style of neck, if we want to make the neck a little wider, if we want the neck to come further down into the body, well, then we want to make sure that the body changes right along with it. And that's the significance of using this master model technique. And, you know, in, in a part like this bass guitar where there's only really these two interfacing parts, uh, it's not as important, but it certainly does make for a good training lesson. And so when we come back tomorrow, uh, or actually Thursday, tomorrow or Thursday, I think it's going to be Thursday. When we come back on Thursday, we're going to get into the next part of this design, which is going to be designing the neck. We're going to go through, we're going to try and capture all the curvature of this neck. We're going to um, continue designing the body because the body is not just flat. It's got this, uh, you know, it's got this uh, chamfer, kind of like a variable chamfer. I'm excited to do that, a little variable chamfer action uh, around the body of this thing. Uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to continue designing this thing, but the big takeaway from today is how to set up your projects, how to uh, do some serialization, 
how to do some serialization of your parts. Uh, you know, come up with a good naming technique that works for you, something that is memorable, and, uh, you know, continue to uh, use that, you know, try to become consistent with it. And then also, of course, how to work with pictures, you know, how to bring your pictures into your design. You want to be looking out for when you're creating your pictures, you want to be looking out for things like uh, perspective, uh, creating some type of a uh, distortion in the image. You want to be looking out for things like... Um, uh, lighting, make sure that you're not getting too much shadowing because if you have too many shadows, it can be hard to trace these things. Uh, you want to uh, make sure that you clean up those pictures in a photo editor, maybe get those pictures to be nice and vertical like what we did here today. And uh, and then once you bring it into SolidWorks, take, take, take some time, take some measurements, make sure that the measurements you're getting from the physical model are matching up uh, in both X and Y to help you determine whether or not there were any distortions from the photo taking process. So I hope you guys enjoyed that today. Uh, it's you know We're going to try to keep these a little bit tight, try to keep them around an hour because I know you guys are very busy uh, with the rest of your schedules. But we're going to come back on Thursday. Uh, I'll do the same time on Thursday. If you're watching this live, uh, leave, me, leave me a note in the uh, chat box. Let me know if this is a good time for you. Uh, I'm open to maybe changing it to later, uh, really essentially adjusting it by about 12 hours. So I can do this at like uh, you know 11 or 12 hours from now. I could do it at like 8 or, eight or 9 at night. Uh, or I could do it right now at uh, 9, 9.30 in the morning. So let me know in the comments. Let me know in the recording. Let me know what we thought about this live stream. Uh, this is something that I've wanted to do for a long time. So it really doesn't matter what you type in the comments or in the, uh, in the uh, live chat. Because I'm going to just go through and do this whole bass guitar. Uh, I think this will make for a very cool model. I think it'll, uh, it'll show us a lot of cool stuff. We're going to get into things like uh, wiring. You know, when we get to do the... Um, when we, when we get to do the pickups, we're going to get into wiring and doing the pickups. We're going to get into things like uh, uh, toolbox, how to work with toolbox components and how to convert those toolbox components into standalone SOLIDWORKS components that no longer have the toolbox flag. We're going to talk about, you know, reusing library components so that you can make the part once and then just reuse it easily. Maybe we'll even talk about like smart components and things like that. So uh, we're going to get into all kinds of cool stuff in this project. I'm excited. I'm very excited to do the strings. Uh, the strings is a fun fun element of this design where you take multiple curves and you blend them together and then you use that for a sweep. Uh, we get to do some fit spline during that. So uh, lots of stuff that I'm excited about with this project. But really appreciate all you guys coming in, joining me today. Uh, are you going to use a macro to make the frets? I think what I'll use, a great question, John. Uh, there's, you know, there's fret calculators out there. Uh, the frets are, need to be like a proportional distance from one another as you go down the neck, and there's a formula that you can use. So a lot of times what I use for that is the, um, uh, what's it called? The, uh, it's like a, the table-driven pattern. Oh, it might be, I might be without it here. No, no. What am I, oh, I'm in the assembly. That's why. So here at the part level, uh, a lot of times what I find works well for that is the the pattern type that's called like table driven pattern. I don't have any solid geometry in this model, so it's not showing up. Here it is, table driven pattern. So when you do table driven pattern, then you can actually copy and paste down here. And oh no no wait wait what am I saying? Variable pattern right? The the uh, the evolution of table driven pattern. So if you if you use this, then you can do this cre uh, create pattern table, and then that lets you actually copy and paste from Excel. So you can create the pattern, you can create the formula in Excel and do fill down uh, once you have your scale length, and then you can create one fret cut, and then you can use the table driven function in variable pattern to have that one fret cut go all the way down. And then at the assembly level, you could do pattern driven pattern and have that fret drop into all those slots. Uh, so that's what I've done in the past. That's, that's kind of what my game plan is for this one, but we'll see how it goes. All right, cool, guys. Uh, great way to start this thing. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments. Be sure to like. Be sure to subscribe. We're going to keep going on Thursday, and we're, gonna, we're not going to stop until we get this whole thing done, and we have a really nice, uh, a nice assembly of this thing. And then we're going to give away the physical base. Whoops, not that one. Not, not that one. Definitely not that one. This one, we're going to give away the physical base uh, probably to somebody in the comments or the chat. Uh, still still locking down the mechanism for giving that away. So it'll be it'll essentially be a random drawing. It, uh, we're just trying to figure out how to uh, get the uh, entries, the best way to get the entries. So that's it, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I will see you on Thursday.